Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel, Breadcrumbs in Fiction, Building a Mystery. My name is Courtney Herring. I am the moderator for this panel. I am the author of a fantasy romance trilogy, as well as a vocal coach for singers and speakers. Today, I am joined on this panel by Megan Bontrager, Katie Edwards, Casey Rogers, Hing Wen, and let's get started. So here is the first question I have regarding this really, really cool panel that I was so excited that I got to moderate because I absolutely love breadcrumbs. They're one of my all-time favorite things to track. I'm the person that makes notes in the, in the like, margins of novels when I find them. So first of all, what are breadcrumbs and how can they be used in a story? Anyone I'll, else? I'll start. <laughs> Um, so, uh, like you said, they're little pieces of information that you can track and follow and see what routes they go down if they lead you somewhere that's maybe a red herring or if they help you actually piece together the mystery. It's little pieces of information and subtext and atmosphere that amount to the bigger picture. Wonderful. Yeah, I think I think for, for me, um, for the most part, my entire series is based around breadcrumbs. Um, I I set out to make an urban fantasy series, and before the first one was even published, I I had planned all nine books in the series. This is something for me that I love doing. I love world building. I love planning the stories. So I knew where all nine books um, have come, and I've been very lucky that I'm on writing book four now. I'm under contract through book six. So I, I got to live my dream of telling the story, and I'm finally at the point where I'm seeing the breadcrumbs um, actually manifest where readers are seeing where I let them. For me, breadcrumbs means the reader has a moment where they go, holy shit, they know what they're doing. They just let us here. They look back and they're like, it was there all along and they can go back. And for for uh, one-time readers, they're kind of surprised almost in a Sherlockian way. For people who maybe read the story two or three times, there's that rewarding sense of, aha, I got it. I saw that. It's um, a really fun element to bring into a story. I, I totally agree, but I approached my breadcrumbs differently because um, I also have a, a, fi a work of fiction called The Color of Frost, and I use breadcrumbs to really propel the narrative and the plot forward because even though it's not a, quote, mystery, I love mystery, and it really keeps the reader engaged because they have... Um, I, I kind of intertwined several different mysterious elements throughout the book. So it really gives the reader an idea or, you know, motivation for keep going and turning those pages. So it's a great way to add mystery to a non-mystery. Yeah, I would agree because I don't, I write in a speculative genre field and a lot of my works involve a mystery, but that's not like kind of the core part of the story, but they're really good for, I think, engaging readers and to build on both what Megan and Katie were talking about. I feel like it's great because the type of breadcrumb you want to inject or the types that you inject throughout a work can be very different. And some of my favorite ones are kind of like the meta ones where they're apparent to the reader, right? Like a character says something and later on the reader's like, that happened exactly, but it's not something the character would have been aware of, right? So I do love how breadcrumbs can take on these different forms throughout works. Mm -hmm. Neat, awesome, okay. So uh, my second question would be, should breadcrumbs be figured out in the first draft? Sounds like Katie Edwards has a very long-term plan, which is so impressive. Or is it okay to add them after the first draft is complete? Does that make them feel less organic or does that seem reasonable to, to kind of back build them? Oh, I'll, I'll tackle that because while I, I do do a lot of planning on my series, one of my core rules is to be adaptable because I've got readers. Um, and I pay attention to them. I read all my reviews on Goodreads. It's one of the things I made myself promise in the beginning because I've learned so much from my readers. I'm very fortunate to have the readers I do. And I pay attention to what they say. And sometimes they influence the course of where things are going to go. Or they 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 let me know that some breadcrumbs I'm, I'm leaving are a little bit too light and some are a little bit too heavy. Um, if you're not adaptable, it, it, it's... Sometimes you can injure your story. There's nothing wrong with putting stuff in afterwards. It is organic. Editorial process is organic um, to writing a novel. I like that. Some of the fun of the revision process, too, is you have all that raw material and you look back. And sometimes I even find that I've accidentally hinted at things 
and uh, my beta readers will say, oh, man, you really led me to that. I was trying to figure it out and it all paid off in the end. And I'll sit there and think, yeah, I did that on purpose. Yeah, <laughs> I meant to do that. <laughs> so then you go back in and you you make it on purpose. And uh, that's part of the fun, I think. Yeah, it's those happy little accidents that maybe you plan something in the beginning as part of, you know, the breadcrumb process, but you have these aha moments and it's like, oh, I could go there or I could add this and it's going to make it even more impactful for the reader. So I don't think there's a reason to put them in before or after or just as you're going along and you discover them you know, like through your process and through your rewrites. Yeah, I'm definitely a planter, so I do outline pretty heavily, but all the kind of nuance to the underlying details, I don't quite have figured out yet. And, you know, as I'm writing towards an outcome, sometimes that outcome changes or detail of that outcome just kind of emerges. And I'm like, wow, it's amazing. And then I have to go back and kind of figure out how to weave that throughout the text. And like Megan said, sometimes I've accidentally already done it. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, very smart of your am. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's really interesting. It's I don't have um, published books yet, so I don't have reviews. But in terms of my readers, they also do that thing where they validate like, oh, I picked up on this or, you know, this was too light. I didn't pick up on this at all, which is good to kind of evaluate work after the fact. Okay, so that leads naturally to the, to the two next questions, which... Um which I'll say together, which is how do you breadcrumb or foreshadow without giving too much away? And how do you balance breadcrumbs with red herrings and blatant facts to keep readers on their toes? It's a hard question. I know it's a little tricky. I'm not sure there is a right answer. I think because, you know, because I'm not really dealing with the mystery genre. I mean, I think I do have a couple of red herrings in, in the color of frost because you don't, know certain things until the very end um and it's it's like well it could have been one person or the other um but i i guess if it works in terms of the plot and keeping the readers engaged then it can't be too much but if it throws them off track a track and leaves them you know boy why you know, this isn't wrapped up or um, they don't know what happens, then it could be too much. So that that would be my approach. Okay. Um, something that I always kind of have to keep in mind, especially when it comes to red herrings, um, I feel like they're only effective if, you know, when you get to the end of the, the book, everything is revealed, you understand everything, and you sometimes have these red herrings where the reader will think oh well that was way cooler than what actually happened so um i think finding the the good balance between um the satisfying breadcrumbs and breadcrumbs that then kind of detract from the actual stakes um i think for me as long as i focus in no matter what else is going on on the antagonist's agency and the protagonist's agency, everything else kind of shakes out in the wash as far as two wants going head to head and things that branch off from that, whether they're true or false. Um, I was watching a TED talk by a magician the other day, and he was talking about the art of misdirection and how um, that can often come from rel unreliable or biased narrative point of views. And, um, I feel like a character could be focused on one thing and the aspect of the world around them that we're supposed to be focused on, they don't see. Um, and as long as it doesn't detract from the actual stakes and the heart of the story, especially for, for those of us who aren't writing in the mystery genre, um, I feel like those misdirections can can be hard. I, I, I try to avoid, I mean, when it comes to red herrings, I avoid them. I really do because I have so many Easter eggs and breadcrumbs that... I've noticed my readers create more red herrings than I do. And uh, I think Megan had mentioned that sometimes it's unconsciously in your story. You don't even see that you provided that possible red herring. And if a reader sees on it, you know, best to them. But I try not to trick them more than I already have. Um, for me, about what is too much or too little when it comes to breadcrumbs, the I think the best example I have is 
one of my, um, I have a series where there are a lot of secrets and they get rolled out over the course of three trilogies, nine books, one, one main character through a, a one massive development arc. And I did parcel out the secrets in every trilogy. So it's not as if readers are going to have to wait to book nine. And I finally got to drop some of my big bombs at the end of book three that just came out last May. And one of the secrets in particular, I got to be careful about this too, because not all readers know about this yet. It's in a, um, a 200 page, uh, the Eidolon is a 200 page follow-up to book three, actually, almost like an expansion novella, because they had to cut a significant portion of my novel. And in it, I reveal something significant where there was something I hid right in front of the reader, like right in front of them. Now, the thing I learned is that you have different type of readers, so you can't predict what your breadcrumbs, how they're going to be interpreted. You can't because you don't know your readers. You have some readers who are going to read once and maybe, you know, they're going to be interested when they find out the twist, but they've read the book once. And that's the, the Sherlockian moment. The people who maybe read it two or three times, that's that sense of reward they got. Like they, they saw those breadcrumbs, they pieced them together. They got some of the mystery and that that's rewarding too. So, you know, writing for both of those audiences together, for me, the, the way that I pull it all off, I think is strong beta reading. Um, I really do. When you're doing a mystery and... I, one of you were just talking about that. I, I think, Megan, the, the payoff at those moments, like, what if it's not there? What if you set all this up and they're like, huh, okay, what's next? It, you know, I want to identify that in advance. I've worked so hard on the arc of this story. I don't want to leave it to chance. I, I try to get as much feedback in advance as possible as a writer. So I know that at least with my test audience, you know, I did have the desired effect. Or maybe in some cases, maybe even better. But that's the thing about breadcrumbs. It's so hard to predict how it's going to hit because you get different sort of people reading your books and, you know, different sorts of awareness or in-depth immersion when they're reading a story. Yeah, I think what you just said was really important because I've had experiences, particularly with my partner who does read time manuscripts, where I think I, you know, lay something throughout and it was a pretty obvious bread come and he was like, oh, that was very subtle. I didn't get that at all. And so I think there's a subjective nature that people are just the same breadcrumb is going to be interpreted multiple different ways. And so I think having those beta readers is important, but also kind of your writer's intuition. Um, like Megan was saying, there's a payoff. And if this leads to the payoff you want, then you kind of just have to make that judgment. Um, but if it is leading to kind of something that you didn't intend, that's where I feel like that may kind of override not override, but if you're kind of wrestling with like, oh, a bunch of subject subjective opinions, then that's where you kind of need to make a decision based on your vision. Um, and in terms of red herrings, I will say I also don't try to plan them in, mostly because I'm not a very like sneaky person by nature. <laughs> so I feel like if I tried to do that, it would be very obvious and feel very inorganic. Um, but I think while writing mysteries, uh, writing mysteries into your work, there's organically like different paths, right? The reader doesn't know something, the characters don't know something, and there are kind of multiple roads forward that kind of already unveil themselves. So using those to explore uh, potential red herrings without trying to like force something, I think has been important for me. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, which was addressed a little bit before is kind of the subjectivity of humans, which I try to also just think about in terms of what is too little, too much um, balancing fact versus uh, other things in a work. Um, and I don't know if any of you have had this experience where for me, there's been like an older family member, so a parent or a grandparent or an aunt and uncle, and they just casually revealed the most bonkers detail about the family in the past that I didn't know was basically a secret, but they just told me. And suddenly like all these different things click. I'm like, oh, that explains all these things that I thought were unrelated. So if you have that experience drawing on that, right? Cause that's a real life experience of something that was a mystery. And suddenly now that you know it, all these other things kind of make, make sense in the past that, you know, probably were intended. Um, and then with fact being like two people could remember the same fact differently. Right. And so playing with that in the work as well, right. There's a factual event that happened, but the character perception is going to be very different and playing with that as you're trying to weave your story. I feel maybe I the, this is a question that should be asked, which is um, how would you, all of you, define the difference between foreshadowing and um, breadcrumbs versus breadcrumbs and red herrings? How would you define those? I think maybe our viewers would really benefit. I know I would from really having those couple of things kind of really teased apart. Another hard question. <laughs> <laughs> 
You didn't know it was going to be a test today. No. <laughs> but I think I would, for, I, I, foreshadowing is the one that I feel easiest to answer. That's the one I think you really want readers to pick up on. You're leaning really heavily into something and giving, it's a huge signpost in the story saying this might be important later. Most readers you expect to pick up on it. Um, uh, breadcrumbs or Easter eggs, you know, you don't necessarily expect everyone to pick up on it. Again, it's the reward for the close reader. And it's also the reward for the people who want to go back afterwards and see that you didn't know what you were doing, that you were leading somewhere. Whereas red herrings are um, false leads for me. Uh, they're, they're, they are breadcrumbs, but they lead to a dead end. Um, if, I, if I put them in my story, that's the best I can do. I don't know if I'm right or not. I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. It's a great question. Uh, well, I agree. I, I love foreshadowing that kind of hangs this thick tension and anticipation over the plot. Um, and you just feel it building and building. And one little thing early on uh, sparks it and it just kind of tumbleweeds into this huge tension that then, again, the payoff. Um, like you said, I, I don't really do a lot of red herrings because I'm also not a very sneaky person. But I, I think that foreshadowing, for me anyway, is a lot more effective than trying to lead someone down uh, a false avenue and then pulling a bait and switch on them. Because then, you know, foreshadowing maintains that tension and that energy and it keeps the reader engaged and wondering and curious rather than confusing them. What I was going to say was, I, I guess I think of red herrings differently. I think think of it almost as being two different options. So it could be one thing or the other, and both are plausible. But by the end, you know what it was or who it was, so that it's not necessarily dishonest, but the way that the reader could take it leads them on and and propels the, the plot of the story so they're like, okay, could it be this person or this person? Um, and in the end, as a writer, it could have been either, but it wasn't because you can't have two people doing the same thing. That's how I'd view red herrings. And as far as foreshadowing, I'd love to use that as a tool because it Again, it, it it really helps to propel the plot of the story. So if somebody has a reason to, you know, oh, well, you know, I this is what's going on. I get a, a, like a hint of this, but I'm not sure what happens. So, you know, again, it's, to, it, it's one of these wonderful tools that you can use when you're trying to create a dynamic of mystery especially for things that really aren't mysteries. They're, again, like my my work, The Color of Frost, it's, it's not a mystery, but it uses those elements effectively to propel the, the you know, drive the character arc and, and everything else so that the reader is constantly wondering and turning that page. And I agree with kind of the difference we've talked about with foreshadowing and breadcrumbs. And I think for me, another aspect of it is a lot of my writing is, you know, culturally informed. I'm injecting, you know, parts of the book tales my mom told me, Vietnamese traditions, other things that I'm exploring in my writing. And so for me, foreshadowing needs to be for all the readers, right? If you don't have that cultural context, you're going to still get the foreshadowing. Um, but like Katie mentioned, the uh, breadcrumbs, some of the Easter eggs, right? Um, they should be accessible to most readers, right? But there are some that are very specific that you're not going to get unless you're Vietnamese and maybe later, hopefully someone finishes the book and looks it up. Um, so that's where, you know, you get that kind of, or at least for me, like I allow myself to maybe drop breadcrumbs that a specific reader would get versus all readers, right? I do think foreshadowing to be effective needs to be accessible by everybody um, in the text, right? Because it's through the way you are um, kind of laying out the plot or things people are saying, et cetera. So that's also how I've thought about the differences between them. All right. This is a really... And um, I already know that this question does not have a specific answer, but we've kind of touched on it a little bit, which is how many breadcrumbs are too few or too many? And I know it's a more layered question than that, but I think it's an interesting question. I think, I think of Lost when I think of too many. Lost is my example for a brilliant show that lost the reins of it. They didn't know, well, I, no, I didn't, no one really knows what happens behind the scenes, but it felt like they lost the 
that they've lost the reign of their breadcrumbs and their Easter eggs and their foreshadowing and it all and their red herrings and it all got muddled together to the point where any reasonable watcher couldn't even remember or distinguish between what came before. It was just too hard to follow and you end up watching it for the characters and the story and the comfort, but you really lost the core mystery behind it, which is a shame because if you remember the first season, it was brilliant. Um, there are a lot of shows like that where maybe they, you know, the the success of the first season surprises them and they're not necessarily prepared with future season and where the story is actually going to go. You can tell when it's done well, but you can also tell when it's not done well. You can tell when something falls apart and loses the thread of coherence, the reader, unless they're going to go back and rewatch or, or reread something. They just don't have much of a chance for understanding it from, from A to Z. I, that's when I've seen it done um, too much. It's they, They're leaning too hard. into it, It's almost becoming gimmicky, in other words, that the breadcrumbs are the gimmick of the story. They're not the story itself. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think a counterexample, in my opinion, of a show that I think did breadcrumbs well is The Good Place, um, where the, the focus was obviously still on the story all the time, and the breadcrumbs were served that, but on their own breadcrumbs, right, where that were delightful to kind of discover as you were watching the show or rewatching it versus having it, oh, this is a breadcrumb first and the second is a story. So I think making sure that priority is correct um, makes for effective breadcrumbs. And I know we've talked a little bit about the difference between breadcrumbs and foreshadowing. So I'll lean into maybe too much foreshadowing. Um, I do, I, I, I am turned off sometimes when the foreshadow is just way too strong. I'm like, oh, this person's going to die very soon, right? <laughs> so that's also part of how I try to balance things, right? So between breadcrumbs and foreshadowing, not being too heavy handed, uh, and it is kind of just what serves the story, what is part of the story I want to tell. And I think there are books that I've read where I there's too much, you're given too much information, too many breadcrumbs with really heavy handed foreshadowing. And I'm sitting there at the midpoint of the book with proverbially the full loaf. And I just know exactly what's going on. I know exactly how it's going to end. I can see, okay, you're lying, you're evil, you know, you get, you have all the answers way too early. And then it's just not fun to figure it out with the character anymore. To a certain degree, I think there is a fun dramatic irony in knowing more than the character. And, you know, you can kind of have this agonizing tension because you know that they're going into a trap or whatever the case may be. But if you know everything, then the fun is just gone. And seeing the character go through that and discover things that you learned 200 pages ago, it's just not satisfying. Not really sure if I have a lot to add, um, but I, I, I agree with the assessment about Lost and The Good Place. I don't really watch a lot of TV, so I think I watched maybe the first season of Lost and I watched the first season of The Good Place. But, um, you know, for me, everything that I used in The Color of Frost in terms of these elements really kind of roll out very organically. And I, you know, I used, um, you know, foreshadowing, of course, like towards the beginning, but I think there were a lot of surprises as to where things came to fruition throughout the book so that it wasn't all just wrapped up in the end, but things propelled the story forward in the middle and it kind of, you know, like allowed the character to veer off, but in a different direction that was surprising. So, you know, again, it just kept things moving forward in, ter in terms of the direction of the plot. So that's how I kind of handled it. Um, no, that's all. That's really interesting. Um, since we're, since you're talking, Casey, uh, I'll take this opportunity to mention that you mentioned that you've written also a nonfiction work and that you also have breadcrumbs in nonfiction and mm -hmm. wanted to give you some time here to kind of elaborate on how you use breadcrumbs in nonfiction. Um, I think it's very important to understand that when you're crafting nonfiction, you really need to use all of the um, elements of fiction to make it, you know, powerful and meaningful because, you know, you're, you're basically, you're telling a story and whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you have to compel the reader to, re you know, to move forward. And so when I was writing Our Better Selves, 
it was a you know it's a memoir so it's obviously it's a very personal story um and it has a lot of ups and downs and it's revealing a lot of personal information but i had to i had to roll out that information and use breadcrumbs to kind of craft a narrative that had the same kind of you know i i broke it down into three acts and i had plot points at a certain place and i you know did foreshadowing and you know created breadcrumbs throughout the the first couple of acts of the the work so again i was constantly giving the reader a reason to continue reading so i posed a question in the very first chapter wondering what was going on with my husband <laughs> of 25 years because I, at that point, I kind of know differently now, but I thought he was having an affair. And that gave um, the reader kind of this insight into what I was thinking, but also it gave me a point to kind of drive the rest of the story forward. So I've actually taught a couple of classes in terms of using the elements of uh, fiction and nonfiction. So it gives the writers of nonfiction an understanding that even though there's, you know, obviously if it's nonfiction, you want to be truthful, you want to base it on facts and information, but you still have to create a compelling story. The characters have to have like, um, you know, an arc. Um, so there are so many things that you can do to enhance your nonfiction work by paying attention to the same things that you would pay attention to in fiction and breadcrumbs and foreshadowing, not necessarily a red herring, but those are really important elements to creating um, a compelling story for nonfiction. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I have never start i haven't attempted nonfiction yet so i'm not sure i would have even thought about that so that's really 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 interesting uh thank you um i have another question that i just came off the top of my head i think i'm really curious with this um and talented knowledgeable panel um more examples of of good breadcrumb laying either tv shows movies book series um, I, I know I'd love to hear just everyone's favorite. I mean, I'll throw out mine. You know, I my first real experience with breadcrumbs was Harry Potter. I was 13 when I read the first one and I was about 24 when the last one came out. And that blew my mind at the time um, because I hadn't read a whole lot of fantasy. I hadn't read a whole lot of series. I had read fantasy. I had read a lot of stuff, but I hadn't read um, Wheel of Time, which I've heard has some really great payoffs somewhere in there. Um, but that blew my mind. So I would just love to hear um, some of your other examples, um, it can, including your own work um, or other work you'd like to promote. But I, I just fascinate. I know Lost comes up a lot when I get into conversations with people about breadcrumbs and shows kind of going off the rails. So uh, I'd love to hear more options, suggestions. Oh, I was going to provide another book example, which is the Lock 2 series, which I love. And I think it's um hero that as i was reading and i got to the end it was like oh my god like also my cat's toying us or my image gets blocked by his wife <laughs> um but that's a good one the series is still um coming out so i'm sure there'll be more to discover throughout the rest of the book i think it's just one book it's three out right now um and one more i believe uh but that's a book example of i think breadcrumbs and kind of leading readers in different directions that was really well executed so if i think of more i may interject but that was my one for now one that i could think of off the top of my head most recently um i read uh just a few weeks ago lies we sing to the sea by sarah underwood um and um it's a pretty straightforward plot but she sprinkles enough to, to kind of give you the sinking sense of dread. I won't spoil it because it's still pretty new. It's an amazing book. 
and it, she pulls this reversal toward the very end about uh, three fourths of the way through where you have to kind of sit there and think back over everything that you've read. And then it hits you at that point that she has been sprinkling things through and she has been hinting and suggesting and foreshadowing. And the subject matter is is heavy and the stakes are high with the characters. I mean, the protagonist dies in the first two chapters. It's not really a spoiler. It's the, the, the whole premise. But she sprinkles in these bits and pieces of things that kind of make you distrust everyone while you're rooting for them still to, to achieve their goals. Um, and she just creates this wonderfully agonizing sense of dread and trepidation that then before the final act, it just, it hits you. Um, and I just think it's, it was wonderfully done um, because then you get that payoff before the end. So then you can kind of see it all fall apart and see it all fall into place and just kind of simmer in that in that tension and in that atmosphere that she's created. It, it was a great book and a great example of this. It's very vague. I don't want to spoil anything because it's good. <laughs> no, it was called The Lies We Sing to the Sea. And, and the other one that was mentioned was the Loft Tomb series. I have that correct? Okay. All right. Um, I, again, I don't really watch a lot of TV, but um, I did watch a series that I absolutely loved with uh, Jillian Anderson called The Fall. And I don't, you know, I don't remember how many episodes there were, but I think it used breadcrumbs and foreshadowing very, very effectively. Um it was a very character-driven show, woman detective, and um, that's something that I could recommend to anybody looking at if they want to see how this can be effectively weaved through a series. Okay. Yeah. I'll use I'll use myself as an example because I'm really <laughs> proud of the one I just pulled off um, in the Eidolon, which is, like I said, it's a 200-page follow-up to book three. And in book three, I was my book of secrets. I've talked about that that's the one book of my series where I, I drop a, what I call a lot of series bombs, things that just blow up your understanding of everything you've read. And I saved one of them for the Eidolon, which is the expansion to it, and also the beginning of a new storyline focused on characters who are not my main character in the main series. And I this was one of my biggest series bombs because from the beginning, I planted an inconsistency in front of readers. From the beginning, like chapter two of my first book, I planted something um, that any close reader upon reflection, Michael, that just doesn't make sense. And I leaned into it for three solid books um, to the point where I would get reviews and I would lose stars because people would comment on that and say, this is an example of, of bad writing or this doesn't make any sense or this shows the author is not committed to all of his characters. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like I really would see those in reviews and people knocking stars off. And I think one of the most, when I finally dropped the bomb that made it clear that if I... One of the things I learned is my series picked up steam and I started gaining a bigger audience. I mean, there's a there's a Discord channel filled with conspiracy theories about my story. I hear about them sometimes, and that's why I, I feel that I don't create red herrings. They do. I'm amazed at the red herrings they create. But I knew that there were people following this, and I knew that there were people wondering. So I realized that to be a good writer, I had to write to two audiences, the people who are going to pick up on it and the people who are not. And I want to make it rewarding for both. And I, I don't want to feel bad that they picked up on my my breadcrumbs. I wanted some people to pick up on it. That's part of the fun. And I don't want to make fun of the people who didn't pick up on it because I want to, I want them to be there for the hell yeah reveal when I finally dropped that bomb in the Eidolon, when I finally wrote a scene I've been waiting to write for literally over 10 years. Um, it was just getting the reaction from readers was just magical. I got one email from a reader saying, you know, hats off. I've dinged you consistently because of this. And it turns out, holy crap, you were planning something. And it it is just so much fun as a as a as an author to be able to do that. I mean, that's just there's a lot we don't get for being writers. We don't get fame, we don't get fortune. That's that's just not the way the world is right now. Recognition you have to claw for. Your growing audiences, you gotta claw for, your support from your publishers, you gotta claw for. It's not the way it used to be, but we still have this, that that relationship with our reader and the ability to transport them into your story and surprise them and to take them away from their day. And from for, for me, breadcrumbs were a huge crutch for that. It was, or not a, a vehicle for doing that. And I finally got the sense of reward when I got to do it. And I will say that the things I learned, you got to commit to it. 
And you've got to always keep it in the front of your mind because if you're putting those breadcrumbs in there, it means you're revealing parts of the story the readers don't know yet. So you've got to remember that when you're writing every single scene that you're being consistent to not just the primary motivation of the character, but that stuff you're hiding below the surface as that's tough. You've got to commit to it. You got to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, that's one thing I had a tough time to the more and more people would follow me on Twitter and ask for hints. I had to keep my mouth shut and I did on this one. And then the third thing is, like I said, just accept the fact that some people are going to catch on and that's okay. That's part of the reward of being a close reader. But I was, this was, for me, that was one of the, the best things about finishing my first trilogy, revealing some of the breadcrumbs. And also, if you do it well, your readers know if, if, if you did a decent job at that, they're looking at other stuff and wondering, okay, what's next? And the key thing is not to go down that bad road of making the breadcrumbs the gimmick of the story. Um, but just to show that your commitment as an author is strong and readers respond to that. And I think it even builds you a bigger audience for the stories you want to tell going forward. Well, wow, wonderful. That's a great segue into kind of my final question, which is, do you have any tips for, for putting in breadcrumbs, for building mystery, particularly in stories that aren't, you know, mystery genre? You know, there's plotting, there's pantsing, there's tricking the audience on purpose. There's all that stuff we've talked about. So are there any tips you have to people who want to write bread comes into their work? Well, I, I work backwards. I know that's probably not for everybody, but I start with the antagonist and what they want. What have they done? Why have they done it? What are they going to do to continue doing the thing that they want to do to get what they want? And they make a decision at the heart of it all. And how does that decision ripple out into the world and change things with each ripple and how far does it go and what has it changed in the world until it hits the protagonist. And I think if you, for me anyway, starting there and working back gives me lots of, uh, lots of things to draw from because it, you know, it, it sets the, the world stage for things that you, you can pick up on and you can capitalize on as you go through. So that's, that's my, trick of the trade, I guess, is to work backwards. Interesting. I like that idea. I like working for the antagonist first until it until what they do hits the protagonist. I think that's a really interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, it definitely lit up my writer brain for a second. I was like, Ooh, I've never it makes my life easier. <laughs> yeah. Great idea. All right. Sorry, Casey, I cut you off. I apologize. Oh, that, no, that, no, that's okay. Um, I was just going to say, I think in anything that you know, any tool that you use should be as authentic as possible. So if you're putting breadcrumbs in that they can't seem like breadcrumbs, you know, like the reader can't identify them and say, aha, this is a breadcrumb, you know, like that it's very organic and it happens in a way that um, is very plausible. So Again, it's not standing out as being a breadcrumb. It it's just um, I think really important to be authentic with your writing. Is your character really going to do this, or you're putting them in a situation where they really don't have the kind of motivation that you're putting them in? Um, you know, so kind of like uh, that wouldn't really happen. So I would just say approach, approach it authentically as, as if it was really something that could happen to your character. Authenticity, that it all comes from a place of truth and serving the character arc and the story and not just trying to kind of throw something to, to trick yes. the audience so that they have something to talk about, right? Right, exactly. Cool. I think that I'll say something I had mentioned before. Really, if, you, if you're planning on using things like red herrings or... Easter eggs or breadcrumbs uh, as a plot device, you really should consider strong beta feedback from a writing group, from actual beta readers. Uh, you don't necessarily need to pay thousands of dollars to a, a freelance editor to do it. You just need to hear from enough people so that you're looking for consensus. You know, if one person says something you disagree with, that's one thing. Two people start saying it, you got to pay attention. By the time three people say it, you've got to examine your relationship with feedback if you're pushing back on it, especially with something like this. If you're Breadcrumbs indicate almost like an intricate story. And if you really want to do justice to what you're writing, get that feedback in advance. It's worth the time as a writer. Um, that's the number one recommendation I make all new writers. Find that source of feedback, whether it's it's a writing group, uh, something that you're constantly getting that feedback 
Um, and as an uh, ancillary comment, it's going to strengthen yourself as well because giving feedback to other people also strengthens your skills, not just receiving feedback. But I think that's a case where beta reading is really critical and it's really going to, and, and be prepared that you might not get the answer you want, but the answer you get might actually lead you to better ideas. That's what brainstorming is. That's what innovation is. That's what being adaptable is as a writer. Yeah. So that's such, such good advice that I, the beta readers, the, the feedback of what you're trying to do, is it landing? Is that kind of what I'm hearing that the idea that people are going to be able to tell you what your goal, what your aim was, you're either hitting your target or you're not. And that's, that's really valuable. And you're right. Giving feedback to other people also helps you as a writer and helps you take feedback. I think for me, when I give feedback to other people, then I was able to take feedback better because I was like, oh, they're doing just what I just did. And I didn't mean anything personal by it. And I really wanted it to be better. You know, I wouldn't have said anything if I didn't think there was value to their, to their work. So the beta reader thing, that's, that's huge. That makes a lot of sense for, for breadcrumbs that that's really where you're, where the best amount of feedback is going to come from. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So my tip was going to be less concrete, uh, but in terms of thinking about mysteries and planting breadcrumbs uh, successfully, I like to think of, because a mystery for me is a state of not knowing something, right? And that is very kind of tantamount to tension, right? And so the whole action of writing a novel, for example, is relieving the tension at certain points, um, you know, upping it again. And I think that state of not knowing is very similar, right? So you begin the story probably not knowing a lot, right? Uh, both the reader and the characters. And so every decision, be it dropping a breadcrumb, um, foreshadowing, providing new information, or information that leads to a red herring, all of that is to either relieve that state of not knowing, right? Give the reader or the character a little bit that they think, okay, now I know I can piece these things together, and then taking it back again, right? Upping the tension. Um, and thinking about where you want that to be throughout the work, because some books and pieces of media do end, you know, you do get some of the mystery solved, but a lot of media ends in that state of not knowing. Like when you finish the final page, you still don't know what fully happened. And that purpose of that not knowing is different now. It's like it's almost like a heartache or like uh, intense curiosity, uh, but it no longer serves the plot, right? And so for me is being very intentional about, okay, why why did I put this mystery here? What purpose does it serve? What is this not knowing due to my characters and the reader? And how should that evolve throughout the story? Or how do I want it to evolve throughout the story? Um, and that's how I kind of figure out, okay, where do I want to place these pieces of information? Um, and it has, that has helped me a lot, right? Because I think that gets to the authenticity bit, right? That it's it feels more authentic then because it fits with what journey I want people to take during the work. So viewing the sense of not knowing that there can be a couple of different reasons for the not knowing. There's just no one knows anything and we're all in it together. And then there's now I've constructed a mystery or a piece of a mystery that is for the reader. And it and that not not knowing now has a purpose and creates a tension. Like I love that you said that creates like maybe it's a heartache. I love that. Um, no, that's that's so it's all so fascinating. And interesting for writing and reading breadcrumbs. I just, I love breadcrumbs. They're, they're my favorite thing. I mean, my husband knows when we're watching a TV show together or I'm reading a book. And if I start talking about threads that have, have yet to be answered, I start to get pretty cranky <laughs> if those threads are never fully answered, which is why I've never completed Lost. <laughs> no, I will be disappointed. That those are the best. Questions are not answered and it makes me crazy. Um, but I, I also see the value of art where there's things are left open for certain interpretation too. I do see the value of that. I just, I do love a, a breadcrumb that goes from one point to another. Are there any last thoughts you guys would like to say on these before we um, are able to talk a little bit about ourselves and our projects? No, good topic. Okay, then let's, yeah. uh, let's just jump in. I'm just going to go in the order of my screen. Um, so I'm going to start with Katie here, who you, what you'd like to promote, tell us where to find you. All of that. Okay, my name is Katie Edwards. I write an urban fantasy series called The Tarot Sequence, and I've also spun off a side series called The Magnus Academy series. Uh, it's uh, It reimagines the world as having a modern day Atlantean culture and focuses hard on themes of found family, queer identity, and lots of humor and adventure, I hope. Uh, my second trilogy, I'm writing the second trilogy now, and you can find me at, God, Katie Edwards underscore NC on Twitter. I think one of those moments where your brain actually freezes and like you can't remember your own phone number. 
uh, kd-edwards.com is my website. And I do put, I, I'm very, uh, Twitter is my platform. That's where I interact with my readers. And I also share a lot of snippets and scenes and uh, hints in advance. So that's the best place to contact me. All right. Casey, where can we find you and what are you working on? Ooh, I actually have an initiative uh, called I Know Why She Stayed, and it launches today. Um, I am working. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's huge. It's something that I've wanted to do for a long time because there's an intersection between both of my books, um, the memoir and The Color of Frost. There are a lot of themes that kind of intersect between the two of them, but the biggest theme that I shouldn't say it's the biggest theme. One of the themes is about financial abuse and how money can be used to basically control people. <laughs> and the initiative is geared towards connecting domestic abuse. And in 99% of the cases of domestic abuse, there's financial abuse because financial abuse creates barriers so that people can't leave relationships. And that's kind of like the overall theme of um, our better selves, how I got trapped into a situation and I didn't have the resources to leave, but I didn't understand why women stayed in relationships until I was in that situation myself. So the initiative connects financial abuse, domestic abuse, and the big kind of surprise is the gender wage gap <laughs> because women not earning the same kind of wages that men earn for the same work, we're kind of robbed of the, the money that we should have in our pocket to the tune of approximately $12,000 a year, which adds up. So the initiative, it's called I Know Why She Stayed. It launches today. You can find out all sorts of information about the initiative, how you can help, because this is something that really impacts us now. Women are most often, you know, like for environmental causes, for reproductive rights, for um, gun legislation, but because we have an imbalance economically, our voices are silenced. There's a video on there that kind of explains it all. And it's on CaseyRogers.com, but it's Casey with a K. So if you guys can help spread the word, it's something I'm very passionate about. And I think we have to address now while we still have the right to address it. So, so that's what I'm doing. Wonderful. And you have a nonfiction book as well as a fiction book. I just want to make yeah. sure that books also get yep notice as well but wonderful initiative um wonderful thank you so much ping where can we find you yes so i am author Hing on most all social media there isn't really one i lean toward i kind of vacillate between all of them um i write speculative fiction and currently on submission with my agent um with a project that is about a vietnamese american spirit medium in the post-apocalypse and currently working on a novel that I'm describing as Gothic Vietnamese Parrot Trap. Um, and in terms of things I want to plug, I do have a lot of Flash published. And currently I have a piece published in All Words, wrong direction, All Worlds Wayfarer, which is a small SFF magazine. So if you'd like to support it, that would be very appreciated. And I am also a mentor for a program called Write Girl, Write as in Writing. Um, which mentors uh, teen girls, but also gender expansive youth um, to generate creative writing. And it's been a really rewarding experience. And they do, you know, they are a nonprofit. So if you want to donate, that would also be very appreciated. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That sounds amazing. Uh, Megan, what about you? Yes, um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram um, at Meg Bontra, just M-E-G-B-O-N-T-R-A. Um, I'm also on TikTok, kind of against my will. Um, my username there is less professional. It's book hag. I forget that that's what it is sometimes until I have to say it in professional settings and then I kind of kick myself under the table. 
Um, but my debut novel, um, By the Ouroboros, is coming out um, a year from the day that this is being recorded, actually, the 15th of April, 2024, um, with Quill and Crow Publishing House. It's um, an urban fantasy based on some urban legends passed around by park rangers in the southern United States. It's it's about a park ranger whose sister has gone missing years ago, and, and she discovers that there are some not-so-earthly things at play in the woods that she she patrols um, that are responsible for her sister's disappearance. Um, I'm also on sub with a Western horror, um, which is a hard left from the debut, but I, I post updates about that pretty regularly on mostly Twitter. Wonderful. I love hearing about people their books and uh, the amazing things that people write now all the different genres that come together i mean it's it's just so fascinating i want to read all these books <laughs> and i'm just gonna add it to my big old stack um this was so fascinating and i so enjoyed talking to all of you um thank you so much for being here thank you for for those of you who can be when this is presented at right hive or who are able to be live and answer questions um so thank you so much I am so thrilled to have been part of this. Um, I hope you had as good a time as I did. And um, thank you to the viewers and good luck out there writing. <laughs>